Previously on Dreamland. Have UFOs crashed on Earth? Have we made alien contact? Is the US government covering up a massive UFO conspiracy? Behind me is one of the most secret military bases in the world, deep in the heart of the Nevada desert. The Groom Lake test site, also known as Area 51 or Dreamland, has been home to US stealth projects since the Second World War. However, in recent years, a more disturbing story has emerged, and that is that the government is back engineering recovered alien spacecraft. It's a story the US government has tried to cover up for half a century. The truth behind Dreamland. I am convinced based on my research and the individuals whom I've had contact in the U.S. intelligence community, that the U.S. government does indeed have uh, craft that meet the description of many of the UFO reports. The whole aim of the project was to take these craft, or the one in particular that I was working on, and try and duplicate its systems and subsystems with earthly materials. So I'm convinced beyond doubt that we have recovered aircraft, alien vehicles, that we have made contact with aliens, that we are communicating with them in some way or form, and that we have vehicles and bodies in preservation. They are here, whoever they are, wherever they came from, whatever they're doing, um, other intelligences are messing around on our planet. I think that too many people's butts are on the line with this, that they lied to us too long, that, uh, that a lot of people have stolen legitimate national security money to keep this cover-up going, that they have uh, perpetuated disinformation schemes on the American public, probably on the British public. The Air Force knows that there was a crash saucer, there were alien bodies recovered, that there have been aircraft that have gone up to chase UFOs and have not come back. They know that we're dealing with the biggest story of the millennium. Based on the evidence of former workers and the unexplainable lights in the sky, there is little doubt that Area 51, seen here in the distance, does house flying craft that are literally out of this world. If recovered alien spacecraft and bodies have been taken to this remote location since the 1950s, could a secret of this size be kept under wraps for so long? And if so, who's keeping it? We're dealing with a cosmic water gate. That means that some few people within the governments of the United States, Canada, Britain, and undoubtedly other countries have known since July 1947 when at least two crashed flying saucers and several alien bodies were recovered in New Mexico that indeed some UFOs are extraterrestrial spacecraft. Since Project Blue Book closed down in 1969, there was no official interest in this subject. That seemed, to say the least, a trifle strange when documents that have come out under the Freedom of Information Act in America uh, show the contrary, show that uh, organisations like the CIA and the NSA are actually very heavily involved in UFO research. There's a relatively small number of people within the intelligence, military intelligence and scientific and technical intelligence community who are aware of what's going on. And an even smaller group who are actually organizing top secret research into this phenomenon. Whenever we'd have a crash, the staff people would tell the public information officer, use uh, story number 38 in the book. And he would, he would release details according to a standard 
release procedure for that kind of a story. And they never told the truth because that was always just classified information. The uh, government is fighting tooth and nail. It will not reveal any kind of information about that base. And as a result, workers, people who helped win the Cold War, who dedicated their lives to these secret programs, who kept their mouths shut for all these years, are dying because of exposure to toxic materials that the government refuses to acknowledge exist out there because they refuse to acknowledge the base itself. If it is already explained, there's nothing exciting, why can't people talk about it? Presenting Cosmic Journey. One of the most revealing glimpses of just what the Pentagon knew about the existence of crash sources and alien contact came in 1989 with the development of a top secret project codenamed Cosmic Journey. Cosmic Journey is a new experience in live entertainment, a new concept and a new dimension. This is something that no one should miss, and I guarantee you that millions and millions of people throughout the world will remember this for the rest of their life. Its aim was to display to the public, by way of a traveling exhibition, the crashed craft and preserved alien bodies that the government had in its possession. The Pentagon enlisted the help of Bob Exler, a NASA mission specialist in robotics, who was also a respected UFO researcher. At a series of meetings in Washington in 1989, military officials set out their plans to Exler. They were devising a variety of kiosks to show the history of the UFO sightings, uh, UFOs associated with the space program, and of course aliens uh, associated with commonly with uh, the abduction phenomena. I was shown a photographic rendition that involved uh, an actual, what appeared to be some form of an alien creature. Uh, typical to the uh, gray aliens that have been referred to popularly in the publications and in the press. Uh, the creature was encased in uh, sort of a glass coffin-like structure that uh, uh, was being preserved. There was a lot of apparatus, uh, tanks and so forth, uh, probably some form of a cryogenic tank uh, to preserve the, uh, the body from decay. As part of his indoctrination program, Exler was flown out to an offshore NORAD tracking facility. Traveling in unmarked black helicopters, they headed out 20 miles off the coast of Florida, landing on what looked like an oil rig. As we got into this facility, we descended to uh, an area that I would describe as sort of a mezzanine area uh, looking out over a control room. This was obviously a, a, a NORAD tracking facility. Uh, there was a huge um, screen. It uh, represented an area of the uh, southeast quadrant of the United States. Then there were a series of uh, lights that were floating along sort of like the top of this uh, grid area. Uh, there were five of them in all. They were labeled, by the way, um, on the screen as ASCs, and I heard someone uh, make reference to alternative spacecraft. The craft went down into this grid, uh, into this vortex area, and then dispersed. And no one seemed to be concerned at all. Presenting Cosmic Journey, an experiential entertainment concept of Kenneth Fell Productions. Cosmic I've Journey not is... since been contacted by anyone associated with the Cosmic Journey. Uh, there have been, since the publication of the book uh, revealing the, uh, the project itself, there have been a number of plausible denials by uh, members associated with the project. And, of course, uh, categorical denials on uh, anything related to the uh, more intrinsic alien issues. The only official UFO investigation that the United States will admit to was Project Blue Book. It was set up by President Truman in 1952 after a rash of UFO sightings over sensitive military areas. Was it a genuine attempt to investigate UFOs, or just a smokescreen to keep an increasingly anxious Congress and public at bay? 
The public was told everything's under control. Signed, Greg Blue Book, that is the organization that's doing the UFO thing. We have access to the finest scientists. There was a whole bunch of malarkey that went along with that. It was set up as a public information office to answer the questions on the UFO phenomena for the public. And their case information, their files, were sent down from upstairs, from where my office was, where my, my desk was. Usually cases that could be explained away, and those were used as sample cases in dealing with the public. The Anything classified above confidential stayed upstairs and even went higher and never got into the, came into the purview of Blue Book at all. I don't think it was a genuine investigation in that the really sensitive reports were filtered out by a more important group than Project Blue Book. We have obtained copies of Project Blue Book documents. There are literally hundreds of reports of UFO sightings and eyewitness accounts from both civilians and military personnel, many that were unexplainable. Project Blue Book is still some 40 years later, the most important body of evidence admitted by the US authorities that we have made contact with extraterrestrials. The investigation was closed down suddenly in 1969. No reason was given. Blue Book was the cover organization. That's the one you heard about. That's the only one ever mentioned and as recently as last year, an Air Force letter to a senator said Blue Book was it, and when we closed it, we got out of the business. In reality, all these other groups concerned with monitoring the skies were continuing to look at militarily important cases. A light in the sky means nothing, but if one goes buzzing down the runway at a strategic air command base where nuclear weapons are stored, which has happened, and we've got some records on that, that's of concern. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. You can go and look through the Project Blue Book records and find numerous sightings which have been, quote, explained and you go and look at the explanation and you find the explanation does not fit the description by the witness or witnesses. That's evidence that the Air Force was trying to get rid of the problem by explaining it away at all costs. The evidence seems to suggest that the United States government is still investigating UFOs. The question is, who's in charge? Both the NSA, FBI and the CIA deny any responsibility because all information regarding extraterrestrials is handled as SCI, sensitive compartmentalized information, even the President of the United States in the White House behind me may not know the whole story. Who's in charge? Is it the President? Is it the Air Force? I'm convinced that we still have an analog with Majestic 12, a group of outstanding people intelligence community primarily and some technological people are running the show. Presidents come and go, the intelligence agencies go on forever. To the best of my knowledge there is no official UFO investigation unit operated by the United States government. However, unofficially the records show that the Defense Intelligence Agency through its defense attache system has a remit to report on UFO incidents worldwide, and that's easily provable, despite the fact that the DIA maintains they have no interest at all in the subject. I tried during my three-year tour of duty to establish contact with an opposite number in the United States. I made repeated attempts to do that, but consistently drew a blank. I was told that since Project Blue Book closed down in 1969, there was no official interest in this subject. I didn't work for the US government. I worked for a satellite government of this country. As far as the Senate concerned, uh, I think there was only one left, and that was Bob Dole. And as far as the presidents are concerned, the only presidents that I feel that I've met 
at the facilities back in the 50s and 60s were Nixon and Bush. We contacted former President George Bush to ask him what he knew about the existence of recovered alien craft and the developments out at Area 51. We received a fax response. Unfortunately, we are not able to provide answers to the questions that you send. President Bush's policy of long-standing is not to comment on or engage in speculation about alleged classified programs of any kind. A close confidant of George Bush and a man well acquainted with Area 51 was Admiral Bob Inman. His credentials are impeccable. He was director of both Naval Intelligence and the National Security Agency, as well as deputy director of the Defense Intelligence Agency and the CIA. In a telephone conversation with Bob Exler in 1989, he referred to recovered vehicles becoming available for research. Do, do you uh, anticipate that any of the recovered vehicles would ever be, uh, become available for uh technological research outside of the uh, military circles? Uh, again, I honestly don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, ten years ago, the answer would have been no. Yeah. Uh, whether as time has evolved, they're beginning to become more open on it, is a possibility. He knew from an official standpoint uh, that uh, these vehicles, these objects existed, that they were in military, U.S. military custody, and that uh, there were scientific projects associated with those. I believe it is the first uh, revelation by anyone in a high enough uh, level capacity within the U.S. government, especially within the intelligence community, to in effect acknowledge that uh, we are indeed involved, that UFOs are real, that uh, they were developed by non-human intelligence and that uh, somehow or another we have acquired possession of that technology. Inman does not say much. There is no reference, there's no mention of UFOs, spacecraft, anything like that. The conversation centers on recovered vehicles, technology and so forth. But um, Admiral Inman was aware of the subject matter and we know from his executive assistant, Tom King, that there was to be no public discussion of these matters, the matters that had been discussed between Exler and Inman because of national secrecy laws. We ask that you not quote him or use his name uh, in any manner without his prior approval. Inman retired from government service in 1982 to become president of Science Applications International Corporation of San Diego. Interestingly, one of the company's primary areas of research is into gravitational propulsion systems, the same method of propulsion of flying disks that Bob Lazar worked on at Area 51. Jane's Defense Weekly, uh, the popular military and defense publication, uh, published an article about SAIC and there's a postscript to the article that anyone who believes in the science of anti-gravity to be too arcane, too esoteric, even for the U.S. Air Force, should consider the electric propulsion study undertaken by SAIC for the Astronautics Laboratory, which is now part of the Phillips Lab. The study's primary objective was to outline physical methods to test theories of inductive coupling between electromagnetic and gravitational forces to determine the feasibility of such methods as they apply to space propulsion and in simplified terms an anti-gravity propulsion system that remains for some the ultimate quantum leap well it's possible one because I saw the equipment that would do it and two it is theory that would work gravity distorts time and like I said that's not a theory we know that to be true and if you're been in space and time along with it when you wind back up in that place you're there between the ticks of a clock we called Admiral Inman to find out what he knows about Area 51 and why his company is developing this gravity propulsion system let me get right to the point that you're after yep. I 
had occasion in several different jobs to ask the question, was there any credible evidence? Uh, when I was the vice director at the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency, I inquired at each of the three places uh, at different times, do you have any credible evidence that would support the existence of UFO or you know, aliens? Yeah. And the answer was always no. James wrote an article in which it mentioned Science Applications International, um, and it referred to some of the development it was working on as the ultimate quantum leap, exotic, shall we say, gravity propulsion systems. What exactly are those, and what, what are, they, are they used for flying craft? I'm pausing because I want to make sure I don't overstate the case. Right. We're on a little sensitive ground here. There have been over the years. Uh, I thought some of the early uh, allegations of activity out in Nevada 15 years ago uh, could well have been reflection of the prototype testing of some of the stealth vehicles. Some are clearly scientific phenomena. Some of it, again, will be so, something as simple as weather balloons right. that break loose, that get lost and go drifting. But there probably is some of it that is directly related to testing of late 20th century, early 21st century military technology related partly to reconnaissance in some cases and others to, you know, attack aircraft. This is the Nellis Air Force Base, one of the top military installations in America. It's split into four main areas. The Tonopah and Nevada test sites, where America's top secret nuclear tests take place, as well as the Nellis bombing range, where the latest jets and bombers are put through their paces. It's also home to Area 51, so if there are flying saucers being tested over the desert, then the personnel at Nellis definitely know about it. We were contacted by a former radar operator at Nellis, who confirmed that she had witnessed a classified flying disc test out in the test range. She left the Air Force in 1985 and is too frightened to reveal her true identity. The flying disc test took place at night in the desert a few miles from the base. I was uh, at, at that moment standing on the deck of the radar van. It was nighttime. And uh, I was looking up in the sky because there were saucers up there. Um, there were 10 to 15 saucers, and they were glowing orange on the bottom. The one that was closest to me, I could see in pretty good detail. I was standing with a group of people of whom I did not know any of them, and they did not appear to know each other. So it seemed like we were all very isolated. Uh, no one was talking to anyone. Uh, it was very frightening because what, you're, what I was seeing was definitely something uh, that was very highly classified. And uh, there was a couple of people talking inside the radar van who I assumed were officers, but no one was wearing any rank insignia and no one was wearing any name tags. The maneuvers that they executed were very sophisticated, um, so my guess is that they were being piloted by aliens who knew exactly what maneuvers they could do. As part of the test, she was taken to what she believes was Area 51. We were taken to a medical facility that was uh, very sophisticated. Someone came and took me into uh, an examining room, and they had me lay down on a, a stainless steel table. And someone came in through the door, walked around the table up beside the right side of my head, saying in a real deadpan, monotone voice, stay calm, stay calm, stay calm. When he got up by the side of my head, he had had a hypodermic needle hidden in his hand. He brought it up, and it went straight into my, the right side of my neck. 
and whatever chemical it was went straight to the brain. It has taken her over 10 years to come forward with this information. It has been very difficult to talk about this. It's almost like uh, every time I relate the story, it gets a little easier. But when I first started talking about it, it was like my mouth didn't even want to form the words and the sound didn't even want to come out of my throat. Uh, so I can only guess from that that there was a very strong suggestion given to me not to talk about this, not to remember it, and if I did remember it, not to ever talk about it to anyone. As recently as 10 years ago, this Lockheed A-12, which flew out of Groom Lake, was still one of the US Air Force's most top secret military aircraft. If you'd seen it in the skies at night, you may be forgiven for thinking you'd just seen a UFO. So how many of the hundreds of thousands of UFO sightings every year are nothing more than military aircraft? And is the great secret of Groom Lake just a 21st century descendant of this airplane? The original test pilot was Lou Shock. The first time he saw it, I mean, he, he rubbed his eyes, he turned around, walked back out of the production hangar at Lockheed and walked back in because he did not believe his eyes. You know, they, initially they were going to call it El Salvador instead of Cygnus uh, for the simple reason in Spanish uh, that means the Savior or Jesus Christ. Like everybody, everybody who saw the airplane could not believe what they were seeing. It was a Buck Rogers airplane. This airplane was built, designed almost 40 years ago. 40 years before that, the hottest thing flying was a Seversky P-35. 40 years before that, it was a balloon. So the technology, technology has not stood still. So there's a very good possibility that we are looking at man-made transportation for the 21st century. The United States Air Force alone um, in 1997, according to the latest budget request, will spend more than $11 billion on research, development, and production of secret weapon systems of one kind or another. That's considerably more than the entire research and production expenditure of any other military in the world. I am very distressed that the black project teams are operating without oversight from official committees, from Congress, if you will, from public oversight, with black budgets that no one knows where it's going or what it's being used for. Uh, I find that exceedingly distressing, frightening, the ultimate big brother scenario. I think the, a good part of the reason for keeping everything classified is because this is an awesome weapon. Now you think uh, the amount of energy that this system can put out, weapon system if you want to look at it as that, and it obviously had some weapon potential. Just think about being able to deploy something like that virtually instantaneously anywhere in the world. Uh, you know, you have a conflict in the Middle East, how long does it take you to get an aircraft carry over there? Well, it takes a long time. Here is an awesome weapon power that flies, that can move somewhere virtually instantaneously and, you know, pound an enemy virtually into dust. Um, yeah, that's something to keep awfully secret. At it you know, at any price, because that's something you can almost conquer the entire planet with. I'm convinced that human beings are building uh, disc-shaped craft. In fact, it was reported uh, that by 1960, the U.S. military had already developed a disc that could operate uh, silently. Man-made flying saucers are indeed real. This is the Avro car, which was launched in total secrecy in 1955, less than 10 years after alien saucers were allegedly recovered from Roswell, New Mexico. A CIA memorandum in 1955 stated that the Avro car was based on research developed by German scientists in World War II. We have obtained the only film ever taken of the first top secret test flights in Canada in 1960. Why was the military test flying saucer-shaped flying craft in the 1950s, when Project Blue Book denied they existed? 
Was it a cover to hide the real alien saucers being tested out at Area 51? Like Project Blue Book, the Avro car was scrapped suddenly in the late 60s after millions of dollars were spent. No reason was given. More recently, the Lockheed Skunk Works in Palmdale, California, unveiled Project Dark Star, an unmanned aerial reconnaissance vehicle. Seen in hangars or in the skies, it is a UFO. I think it's time that you get a look at the newest star in the world of airborne reconnaissance. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Dark Star. Dark Star is a very unusual looking aircraft. It has a saucer shaped body and a pair of very long slender wings attached to the back. Like many stealth aircraft, including the B-2, its appearance varies drastically according to what angle you see it from. If, for example, you see the aircraft kind of edgeways on, you might well think that this was something totally foreign, totally unlike any conventional aircraft, and certainly much more like what people have described as flying saucers. I think it's quite possible that some of the things that are being developed in the United States today are of such a revolutionary nature uh, and still very secret that when they are seen from time to time, as things inevitably do get seen when they're tested, that they could be mistaken for what people think are, are UFOs. At any given time, of course, the technology that we have is five or ten years more advanced than the technology that is on public display. But these sorts of things do not fly over the heads of bewildered uh, members of the public. They fly exclusively in uh, very clearly defined ranges and danger areas. So the sorts of things that are being reported as UFOs will not be ours. In September of 1947, the Air Force wrote to J. Edgar Hoover a letter saying we've checked all of our research projects, etc. You know, it's not just the Air Force, but the Navy and the Army, everybody. And we have nothing that could create these flying disc sightings. A big UFO convention came to an end in Las Vegas last night, and afterwards, naturally, some of the members went out in the desert to search for UFOs. A news crew went along, too, and sure enough, it wasn't long before a mysterious, unidentified object appeared. Not too surprising, somewhere up there, you see it, because this patch of desert is right near a military test site. This looked like no aircraft lights that any of these folks had ever seen. Was it a bird? Was it a plane? Was it the Aurora, the secret plane? We don't know. More to come, I'm sure, and the Air Force is not saying anything as usual. If UFOs are man-made craft, how do you explain the tens of thousands of cases of reported alien abductions every year? In 1975, seven loggers were heading home after a day in the forest to Sholo, Arizona, and came across a bright light in the trees in the distance. Driving closer, they could clearly make out the shape of a flying saucer, which was lighting up the forest around them. Mike Rogers and Travis Walton were in the truck. Stop, Mike! Stop the truck! It uh, had lighted spots on it, and was basically metallic, had a metallic framework. Uh, my first feeling was that it looked rather beautiful, uh, but at that time it wasn't making any noise and it wasn't moving, it was just quietly perched there in the air. Thomas! Robbie! You son of a bitch! What are you doing? My God! When it started to move, the sound got real powerful. And I, I jumped for cover, and I got down behind this log, and the guys were yelling, get away from there, and they were swearing and everything. And I was, you know, pretty scared myself, and I made up my mind to make a run for it. And when I raised up, wham, something hit me. A beam of energy, a bolt of lightning, but it wasn't like lightning. It was like straight-sided, like a, like a deliberate beam of energy, but it was so powerful it created like an explosion that lifted him off his feet and blew him backwards. And here's Travis flying back through the air, uh, just he landed some distance from where he'd been standing, landed flat on his back, and as he's going through the air, his arms outstretched. He he looked lifeless at the time, like the concussion of it had already 
killed him or knocked him out or something. Well, I could hear the sounds of movement around me, and I, uh, I had trouble focusing my eyes at first. I saw there was light above me, and the ceiling was very close. I could feel I was laying on top of some hard raised surface. Um, but when I finally got where I could focus my eyes, and I, and I saw these creatures standing over me, I just flipped out. I just instantly became hysterical. I started screaming. <laughs> I was definitely not in a hospital. And can you describe what these aliens looked like? Well, they were basically humanoid, you know, two arms, two legs, like that. But uh, they uh, had very large heads, um, hair, no hair, huge eyes, sort of a pale uh, grayish white skin. And they were wearing. Uh, coveralls, a kind of a brownish uh, coverall. After spending what Travis remembers to be an hour or two inside the craft, the aliens put a mask over his face and he awoke in the middle of the road with the craft above him. He'd been missing for five days. What do you say to people who, who say, you know, these seven loggers in the woods have just made this whole story up? I mean, you know, seven people are, are see the same thing. They stick by their stories for, for over two decades. You know, ever, all of us have taken polygraph tests. Every theory the skeptics come up with is just absurd and, and easily proven so. Well, I spent a day with Travis and Mike Rogers. He passed the lie detector test. Their story is consistent. There were five other people there, after all, who saw part of these events unfold, who also passed the lie detector test. Uh, his story is consistent, it's never changed. In a court of law, that would make the case. I found his story uh, profoundly convincing. This is the Saratov Air Base, 200 miles outside Moscow. Behind these barbed wire fences is the Russian equivalent to Area 51. If you thought only the US government had flying disc technology, then you'd be wrong. The Russians have been working on a secret project codenamed Tarielka since the Second World War. Security here is unprecedented, and this perimeter fence is as close as we've been able to get to the base. We did secure some footage of the flying disc in the hangar. The code name for the project is Ekeep, and it has been designed for humans to fly. We asked the scientist in charge of the project what propulsion system the craft uses, but he would not divulge what he called classified information. What is clear is that Tarielka is aimed at the commercial market, not the military. The Russian engineers here at Saratov see this as an alternative to aeroplane transport in the 21st century. Where the production and design expertise came to build the Terielka, no one is saying. But surely it's more than just a coincidence that the base here at Saratov is so similar to Area 51, both in location and security. And as in the US, the Terielka project was started in the 1940s just after the alleged saucer crash in Roswell, New Mexico. I'm pretty sure that the Russians have those craft. We were told directly by a leading Russian scientist who had worked, hands-on worked on these things, that uh, both the United States and the USSR had, had uh, acquired information from captured Nazi scientists and had built craft like these. They knew that we had them. We knew that they had them. The story I got from the Russians before is, uh, the, these same scientists who felt that there was an alien connection, Stalin himself, I was told, ha believed in this alien connection, that these things came from somewhere else. Now, I think because of the political changes and the political uncertainties in that country, even these scientists are, are backing off from that position. Well, we're not quite sure if these are alien anymore. Uh, they're, they're not certain that the Kremlin needs any kind of a UFO expose right now. The Tarielka will be on display at trade shows around the world in a few years' time. 
sold off to the highest bidder. The fact that mankind may be transported in flying discs in the early part of the 21st century is a startling transition from science fiction into science fact. Have alien saucers crashed on Earth? And have we back-engineered these craft to develop our own 21st century flying discs? The answer, however improbable, is yes. Area 51 does exist, and we have eyewitness accounts from at least two former workers at the base who confirm the existence of alien spacecraft. The truth seems to be out there, but will they ever admit it? It's likely to be a very long time before we discover uh, what is actually being done out of Groom Lake now. If you look at the intelligence community particularly, um, they seem to wait anything from 15 to 20 years or more after something has been retired before they acknowledge its existence. Therefore, if things are operational now, we may not see them for another 30, 40 years. What also happens at that point is that Things remain secret for so long that the people who originally decided they should be classified are retired or quite possibly dead. And it becomes almost impossible to declassify a program at that point because nobody knows quite why the secret is being protected. The Air Force headquarters files up through 1955, 9,800 feet of material, that's a thousand four-door filing cabinets. When I went to ask for stuff out of these files, only 10% of the boxes I was interested in had been classification reviewed. And in those boxes, there were withdrawal sheets all over the place. So secrets can be kept. They are being kept. One way that they're being kept is the naivete of the people who think, yeah, if this was going on, I would know about it. The ego is a powerful weapon. They have to know that it has to come out. And it has to be part of their program that it will come out. We just don't know what the agenda, what the time frame is. I think it's very reasonable, let's say if contact were made in the 1950s, I think it's very reasonable of the government to say, let's keep it secret for 40 or 50 or 60 years so we can study it, so we can reproduce the craft, so we can understand what it is we're dealing with and release it to society slowly. Perhaps that's what they're doing now. Do you think the secret will be out in a few years' time? I'm saying because I've got permission, I'll turn my papers over to you in 2002, and then you'll know who I am. It's my impression that eventually there will be a weight of evidence uh, so massive that our society will ad admit that they are here, and at which point the government will have to admit that they've known a lot more than they've said all along. And this isn't just the U.S. government, you know, this is virtually every government in the world. In 1979, the SETI program was set up to search the far reaches of space for intelligent life. It would seem that we now have an answer. The real reason for the cover-up is likely to be far more sinister than mere secret technology. We have to consider that the aliens themselves may be controlling the cover-up, especially if they don't really want us to know what they're doing here. Even if there is some communication between uh, the government and them, everything is being run by the ETs. They're so far beyond us in terms of technology that uh, I don't think we would have a chance. they, the officials in charge of this information, are going to look rather impotent were it known that there are extraterrestrials invading our airspace against whom we have inadequate defence. investigated dreamland for over a year. Whilst we didn't see any flying disks or alien bodies, we did see lights in the sky which could not have been aeroplanes, military or otherwise. 
We have proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that Area 51 and a large underground base out at Groom Lake does exist. We've seen the workers fly in and out of the facility and talked to alleged former workers at Area 51 about their back engineering of recovered alien spacecraft. We've seen actual footage of man-made flying disks, both American and Russian. And there are warehouses across America housing files like these, full of UFO reports and alien abductions. Is this body of evidence just a figment of someone's imagination? I think not. As we move closer to millennium, mankind will have to face up to the startling reality that we may not be alone and that a select group of US government officials have known about this for some time. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet I ask you, is not an alien force already among us?